samples as it turned out we were. Uh, so you and I met on Monday morning. And, um, you ran the chain of custody forms and you passed off your iced samples to me. Uh, three water samples and a sediment sample. Um, I brought them here to this lab where I personally prepped the samples um, using our uh, EPA standard method 3051, which is basically um, using a microwave digesting uh, reactor to prep our samples and free up the metals from any compounds they might have been in in the water or sediment uh, for ease of quantification over in chemistry in Carroll's lab. So uh, that all occurred on Monday. Uh, yesterday we actually took the chemicals from, or the, the, the prep samples from the microwave and ran them over in the chemistry department on their inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectrophotometer, the ICP OES. Um, and we finished last night about 9.30 quantifying the samples. That was Tuesday night. And Dr. Fabian, will you tell us a little bit about the, the techniques that were used when you ran the samples? Okay, so um, as Shay said, the instrument we use is, um, it's based on optical emission. So basically, um, the sample was introduced into a very hot environment as a liquid, and that hot environment was called a plasma. Um, that hot environment atomizes all of the elements in the sample. It also promotes them to an electronic excited state, which is very short-lived, only 10 to the minus 8 seconds. Um, so after existing in that excited state, the elements relax down to back to their ground state, and in that process, they emit radiation. So every element emits radiation at a unique wavelength. So we decide what wavelengths to use for each element. So that's how we determine what elements are in the sample. To determine the concentration of the elements in the sample, we look at the intensity of radiation emitted by each element. So we have wavelength, which tells us what is in the sample, and then intensity of emitted radiation, which tells us how much. Um, we calibrated the instrument using certified standards. Um, our blank um, was acidified, and our blank was uh, very pure water. We had a near pure water system over in chemistry that we used. Um, our quality control protocol consisted of uh, regular calibration, and then we also prepared what we call a laboratory fortified blank. That's just a solution we prepare, we analyze it as if it were a re real sample, and then we look to see if we got the expected concentration. Um, that's, uh, about, that's about it. That's, um, we followed uh, EPA method 6010, which is, you know, the ICP emission method for metals. And after working with the samples under your command, under your control at all times, can you tell us a little bit about the results you saw? Yeah, they were pretty interesting. Um, knowing that they had come from the TBA spill, we knew that they were going to be high in a number of heavy metals of interest. Um, but of the 17 we, we uh, tested for, from aluminum down to zinc, um, eight of them popped out as, as significantly higher than they should have been for drinking water. Um, and when you can take in consideration the aquatic biota levels that the state of Tennessee puts in place, which are sometimes more stringent than human drinking water levels, um, some of those uh, levels got even more significant. But some of those that really pop out, as it's been in the press already, arsenic was quite high. Um, the drinking water levels uh, are about 10 parts per billion. That's 10 micrograms per liter. And from the three water samples you gave us, we had anywhere from 35 to 300 times that level in the water samples. That's total arsenic. So all species of arsenic, both dissolved and particulate forms that were in that water. Um, so that was really significant. Um, some of the others that pop out were like cadmium, were two and a half times the maximum level allowed. Um, if you look at the Tennessee aquatic life levels, um, it's about four to seven times that maximum level. Um, chromium, three and a half times. Um, copper was was higher than you wanted to try not anywhere near what it would be to have an effect on humans, or the 1.3 parts per million were never exceeded. Uh, but lead, 2 to 21 times higher than expect, or than allowed. 
Um, and again, if you go to the Tennessee Aquatic Life uh, criteria, six to 60 times higher than they allow. Mercury, um, we found very low levels of mercury in our testing, but the ICP is not the best instrument for, cut, uh, for quantifying those compounds. And we had somewhere between five and eight times the allowable levels. Uh, selenium, which is, uh, was of concern, we found very little. It was not an issue. Um, thallium, which was also in the press, along with arsenic, is something to keep an eye on. Um, three to four times higher than the maximum allowed for drinking water. So um, of our 17 elements, we found about seven or eight that were higher than the EPA levels would allow for drinking water. Uh, most of those were higher than would be allowed for um, aquatic life to survive and reproduce. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much in a nutshell what we found. Um, I would like to comment uh, something on something related again to our procedure. Uh, we should mention that um, when Shea prepared the samples, he took each sample and he analyzed each sample in triplicate. So, you know, so we had, you know, three digested samples that we analyzed in chemistry on the ICP, and that allowed us to look a little bit at reproducibility. And uh, we do feel that, you know, for most elements, our results are fairly reproducible. Um, you can describe reproducibility by calculating a percent relative standard deviation, and, um, you know, they can be as low as 3%. Sometimes we do go up to 22%, which is maybe a little bit higher than what you wanted. Um, but where we do get the poorest reproducibility is for the mercury data. And again, Shay already mentioned that we really don't have the best equipment to do mercury. So we want to, you know, we do want to have um, some caution with our mercury data. But, you know, we did analyze each sample in triplicate, and we do have very good relative standard deviations overall. It's pretty pretty tight value so far. Great. And so, based on your experience doing research um, uh, throughout Appalachia um, on on the aquatic environments, in aquatic environments, water environments, how do these results compare to your experience as experts in this field? Comparing them to other studies I've done, uh, both in the lab and the field, I've never seen field levels as high, um, except maybe for. A, some acid mine drainage uh, from a copper mine. Uh, as far as other impacts of things like uh, hog waste or chicken waste or something like that, nowhere near these levels. Um, from lab work I've done, uh, levels much lower than we're finding in the field have actually, I used to do research with crawfish reproduction, and these levels would knock out crawfish reproduction. I would assume they would, t they would knock out fish reproduction, um, not to mention mussels, freshwater mussels. So um, the take I take from this is that the ecosystems around Kingston and Harriman are going to be in trouble, uh, the aquatic ones, for some time until nature is able to bury these compounds in the environment. Um, I don't know how long that will take, um, maybe generations. But certainly the quantity and concentration of the ash of these heavy metals is going to be an issue for them not just the aquatic life, but maybe the birds as well that are now picking up the dead fish, consuming those, those sediments that might be attached to those fish. And so they're actually consuming and taking into their body, which is the, the highest level of risk you can have with these heavy metals, is actually ingesting them. So either drinking or eating them um, is really the only way you can become an issue unless you're breathing them. And then that's coming into play with, with these dry ash piles start drying and become uh, picked up from the winds, and you can actually breathe them in, that's the third way to become exposed to it. Um, kind of chattering on here, but the EPA already list, has already released a, a two-page letter to the people of Kingston, kind of giving them a risk assessment. Um, I think they were right on the money with it. I think that they had uh, adequately assessed the risk of the human population there. I think their number one concern was the drinking water supply of Kingston, which is a number of miles downstream in another river upstream, half a mile, so they're actually safe from the intake uh, point of view of, of getting any downstream runoff from the spill. But um, as it was mentioned in that letter, the, the springs and the well water in that area needs to be closely monitored to see if there's any um, movement of these arsenics uh, 